Well, our passage this morning from the Gospel of Mark describes a moment on a mountaintop when the light and love of Jesus was extraordinarily visible, glowing and shining with God's glory in a moment when the veil between heaven and earth was lifted. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 10. Let us listen for the word of God. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there is a Celtic saying that heaven and earth are only about three feet apart. But there are certain places in Celtic spirituality called thin places, places where that distance is even smaller, where the veil that separates heaven and earth is lifted, and we see and experience the wonder and glory of God. These thin places are often part of a landscape that is wild and full of beauty. A mountaintop, a desert, a river, a forest, or a valley. Contemporary poet Charlene Sledge gives this description. She writes, Thin places, the Celts call this space, both seen and unseen, where the door between the world and the next is cracked open for a moment, and the light is not all on the other side. God-shaped space, holy. You know, I think if we were asked to identify moments in our lives that were meaningful, powerful, and holy, we might look back and describe them as a thin place, a God-shaped space. Uh, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place kind of experience where there was no denying a sense of revelation and wonder. And in that place, in those moments, heaven broke in. Does such a time come to your mind? Maybe it was a time when your eyes were opened to a, a new insight or understanding that shifted assumptions that you had long stood upon. Maybe there were deep emotions. Maybe there were people who blessed you deeply. Maybe it was a moment of birth or of death or an experience of forgiveness, freedom, or grace. The veil was lifted and God came to you with light and with love. And you knew, even though you couldn't really put it into words, you knew that you had been in the radiant and warm presence of God. And even if this moment was years ago, or maybe just days ago, it continues to shape you. It continues to shape us. Well, our scripture passage today from the Gospel of Mark is just such a thin place. Here in the very center of the gospel, the transfiguration of Jesus is a vivid revelation of who Jesus is. As the Nicene Creed puts it, he is the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God. But for the disciples, up to this point in the gospel story, Jesus has been to them a remarkable rabbi that they drop their fishing nets to follow. Jesus has been an astonishing healer and one who welcomes people that no one else would even touch. And yet there is so much more to who Jesus is and what he is called to do that the disciples have yet to grasp. Just six days before Jesus leads Peter, James, and John up the mountain, Jesus had tried to tell the whole group of disciples that what lay ahead for him was a cross and resurrection. This telling the disciples of what lay ahead for him did not go so well. You see, not only among the disciples, but also among the people, there was a long-held vision of a Messiah who would come in the mold of King David, a political leader who they imagined would save them by the storming of the city of Jerusalem with dominating power, overthrow the Romans, and forcefully restore the glory of their nation to its good old days. Well, friends, let's take a minute and listen to Jesus' words to the disciples in this previous conversation, because we will need to carry his words with us up the mountain. It's at the end of chapter 8, starting at verse 31. Let's listen. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days, rise again. When he said this, the disciples were just not having it. Peter had taken Jesus aside and rebuked him, saying, No, Jesus, this cannot be. This is not my vision of the future. This is not my vision of my Messiah. Well, Jesus had turned and gave Peter a rebuke of his own, one that surely stung Peter, but it had to be said. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus told Peter. He said, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Well, maybe that difficult conversation is exactly why Jesus leads Peter, James, and John up the high mountain path. Perhaps Jesus knows that the time has come to reveal to them at a new depth, with a new dimension, who he is and what kind of Messiah he must be. Just as the path curves around, they reach the summit and Jesus is transfigured before their eyes, his clothing gloriously changed into dazzling heavenly brightness beyond any human capacity, Jesus is a visual wonder, brilliantly shining, glowing, spilling over with the divine light with an intensity that terrifies the disciples. Joining Jesus and his glory are the greatest figures from Israel's history. There is Moses, the receiver of the law and the covenant. There's Elijah, the prophet of justice and righteousness. These people have led God have led God's people in liberation from oppression and in faithfulness in the face of idolatry. Moses and Elijah have stood in the shining and intimate presence of God on mountains before, in their own day, face to face with God's light and love that equipped them in their calling. There could be no more glorious assemblage than this. Moses, Elijah, and God's Messiah. No wonder Peter says, it is good for us to be here. You know, I imagine Peter might have been relieved, thinking, now this is more like it. No more of that suffering servant or dying Messiah scenario. Divine glory, after all. So let's make three dwellings, and we can stay here forever. Well, you have to love Peter because he is us. 
It is so human to want to hold on to these moments that are our best, but inescapably limited understanding of what divine glory actually means for us. It is so human to want to set, set the divine dial to line up with our preferences, our privileges, our biases, our rationales, and then to offer to build a box around the whole thing, right? So, so that we don't have to change our vision, so that we don't have to change our lives. Just when Jesus could have rebuked Peter again for having his mind set again on what is human rather than divine, instead they are enveloped in a radiant cloud and the voice of God speaks, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. This is my son, the one in whom I delight, the one in whom my love is poured out, my love that will transform, my love that will redeem, my love that will save. You see, the glory of God manifested in Jesus' transfiguration is a glory that, as human beings, we can so often misunderstand and even misuse. As pastor and scholar Eugene Peterson noted, the glory with which Jesus is transfigured is, quote, different from the kinds of glory that we are conditioned to want and admire. This glory is not conspicuous. It is not glamorous. It is not a glory that flatters our lusts and our egos. And you know, I would add to Peterson's description of this divine glory that it is certainly not the power-seeking, violence-wielding, white supremacist distortion of Christianity and the alarmingly strong current of Christian nationalism most recently manifest in the storming of the Capitol in January. The glory of God that shines in and through Jesus and that by God's grace has the potential to shine in and through us is a completely different kind of glory than we as humans may expect or want. It's the glory of a Messiah who took the path of humility, of obedience, and self-giving love. It's the glory of a Messiah who is crucified, descending to the depths of our alienation from God and one another, and reconciles us by bearing our sin in his own being. It's the glory of a Messiah who is risen and who, is, who takes us by the hand and raises us from death along with him. Well, when the cloud disappears, the disciples are left with blinking eyes and incredulous hearts. And who wouldn't be? They, they head back down the mountain, following the one who just moments ago was glowing with dazzling glory. And although Peter and James and John leave the mountain, probably a little dazed and confused, I believe that they also left, whether they realized it or not, that they left strengthened and nurtured for their journey ahead. That in this divine, glorious encounter, God was shaping and equipping them for the work and ministry of Christ for which they and other men and women who followed Jesus, for whom they will become servants and leaders and apostles and even martyrs, even though they can't even imagine it now in this moment. Because the light of Christ that they encountered on the mountaintop will continue to shine on them and through them and light their path. The disciples will eventually come to trust and to be transformed by the love of Jesus that will live in them. And the glory of God that they just experienced will continue to shape them and equip them, even as they descend from the mountain and into the valley. It will continue to shape and equip them even when times are hard, when they struggle to live out their faith, when challenges overwhelm, even when they fail 
Jesus' light and love will be with them and sustain them. Because that is what happens in these thin places, then and now, whenever, whenever the Spirit opens our eyes and hearts and the distance between heaven and earth dissolves. When God meets us and graces us with the assurance that God is with us in Jesus Christ and that in him we are loved, forgiven, and made whole. And we are transfigured. We are transformed by the light and love of Jesus that lives in us. And we are nurtured and strengthened for our journeys. Then as Jesus' disciples transformed, we are then sent out to embody the glory of God in the everyday realities and complexities of life here at the base of the mountain and out in our valleys, out in our community, in all of our needs and our hopes, where there is pain and where there is also possibilities for healing. Out in the valley, even now, as we wait for vaccines to reach everyone, as we continue to work for justice and the healing of division in our nation, as we care for brothers and sisters who are isolated and lonely, as we care for those who worry about their loved ones and who do not know if they will have food and shelter next month or next week. As part of our church mission statement says, we are called to help people care for one another, allowing Christ's love to live in them as we journey through the mountains and valleys of life. This, this, as stated so clearly in our mission statement, is how we are called to embody the same glory of God and Jesus Christ that transforms us, that strengthens and nurtures us with a glory that serves others, that seeks the well-being and welcome of everyone, a glory that lifts up the lowly and takes the path of humility and obedience because it seeks life and transformation for everyone. What did the disciples encounter when they came down the mountain? Well, I read ahead a little bit, and I think it's important. So they reached the base of the mountain. The community comes out to meet them, a community with its own needs and hopes. There's a father who comes forward, distraught because there is a spirit causing harm to his son, making his son unable to speak and causing episodes of great pain, even trying to destroy him. You can read the details in the Gospel of Mark, but the gist of it is that Jesus casts out the unclean spirit and frees the child. No longer tormented, the son lies still. Jesus takes him by the hand, lifts him up, and the child stands. You could say he was transfigured, transformed by the glory, the life, and the love of God in Jesus Christ. May we, as Christ's disciples, follow where Jesus leads us, from the mountaintop and down into the valley of our lives and of our world, bearing his glory, sharing his light and his love for the sake of God's ongoing work of the healing and transfiguration of the world. May it be so. Amen. Amen.